Good afternoon, beautiful people of planet Earth and all other interdimensional entities of love, light and truth and holiness because I'm not communicating with anyone, you know, negative. Um, <clears throat> she says, while immersed in an entire world that's gone to its own shit stain of negativity, just saying. But however... <clears throat> I had a beautiful night last night while out dancing wildly. Um, it was just delightful. My friend invited me to uh, come to other gigs, which I said I would be happy to do. Um, but not the Irish Murphys gig, just saying. They would have to pay me a great deal of money and write me a public written apology. Ah, but anyway, also Mama, Mama T very rarely curses. I'm not that kind of a witch and uh, my curse stands. I guess it'll have to stand until it's fulfilled or until I die, whichever comes first. But anyway, I'm going to be very stubborn about that one. There was too much damage done to me and other women so I'll be holding my line on that but anyway my, my my beautiful soulful friend then suggested I go to another venue which I said I would be more than happy to do and uh, so the dance continues and the wildness continues and the joy and passion of the music continues and um, I'm feeling very, um, very much loved, valued, appreciated, and blessed right now. Um, my friend asked me if I was staying happy and healthy during the week. And I said, oh, well, you know, darling, I'm always happy and healthy. Pause when I'm not dying. And we both looked at each other and had to chuckle because it is a bit like that. When I'm not dying in death cult consciousness, trying to survive my own fucking decades of difficulties and uh, the malaise is imposed upon us by our government, by our government and um, our global regimes. Uh, when I'm not dying from that, I'm living very, very nicely and excitedly and wildly and passionately indeed. Because the law of the universe is always the yin and the yang and the flux and the flow. And uh, once you get into that constant state of uh, knowing how to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and stay in the flow of life, very beautiful, magical, heartfelt, gorgeous things manifest for you. That's what I'm seeing in this moment in time anyway. And I'm very happy about it. So it was quite delightful standing in the queue to get into the Brooklyn Standard. Some, uh, there was a, a, a couple in front of me, younger than me in their, you know, I suppose, mid to late 30s, passionately kissing. And I'm trying not to roll my eyes because, you know, love is love is love, but... Fuck me, get a room. But anyway, after a while, I thought about it. And I thought, I'm just old and bitter. Well, I'm not really bitter, but I'm just getting older now. So I'm watching them, you know, passionately kiss. And then it occurred to me, I thought, oh, this is a new budding romance. This is a new, a new love, you know. It just came to me as clear as day. And there was a, a young woman joined the queue behind me that walked in dancing. And I said, oh, you're ready for a big night boogieing? She said, yeah, I already started. She was delightful, that young woman, young girl woman. Anyway, the, the woman that was passionately kissing in front of me stops kissing her man and turns to me and with great seriousness looks at me and says, you're beautiful. You know when you're in love, the whole world is beautiful and magical, don't you? There's an old saying, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek, when you're in love, the whole world is Jewish, right? 
think there was an entire movie about that. It was meant to be a satire, but it's kind of true. When you're in love, you see everything through rose-coloured glasses and the whole world is suddenly gorgeous. So she's looking at me saying, oh, you're beautiful. And her young man's looking at me too. And I'm like, turn my head slightly. Because I do scrub up lovely with all full makeup and the full mama to the Tanya persona and that. So I do scrub up pretty, pretty okay. But anyway, so I looked at this young, young girl woman. She was far more beautiful than I. So I'm looking at her astonishment. And then she sort of frowned and I went, what? And she says, you're supposed to reply, thank you. That's so kind of you. Which is quite correct. She said, accept a compliment with good grace, she said. She's quite quite correct. I've been I'd been told last night quite distinctly. So I turned my head and I said, Oh, thank you. I said, but the reason why I'm a bit confused is you're the beautiful one. <laughs> She's but that wasn't why I said that. And I went, I know, I know, I, know, I, I get ya, I get ya. She, and then she turns to me and she says, it's my first date. And I was like, oh, I see. I think I could tell that by the passion. <laughs> I said, you make sure you have a wonderful night tonight, darling, before you go home and make mad passionate love. In other words, insinuating don't jump in too quickly and have a wonderful night. Anyway, the security guard, Richard, I think I must have spoken a bit loud, more loudly than I had in, in, you know, meant to. He, um, because he was about four or five people in front of me, and he just kind of looked at me. We both started laughing. I thought, oh, Mama T, worrying about the young women getting used and abused and tossed aside and discarded, you know, as happens, as happens sometimes on first dates that go bad but anyway her young man just grinned at me and laughed he didn't take it as an insult which tells me he's a decent man because that could have been interpreted in an ugly way if you were in that kind of mindset anyway they get into the club they were ahead of me and oh they were so sweet the two of them I'm looking at them like oh, I can't remember ever having such a romantic passionate start to a relationship like that but how delightful anyway later on in the night um late much later on the night uh, that young lady young woman oh yes i met her fighting my way through to go to the toilets and i said to her are you having a wonderful night darling of course i knew she was and um she says oh yes i'm having the most wonderful night and I'm quite drunk now. I was like, oh, lovey. Oh, that's good, lovey. I said, it's good that you're dancing, having a wonderful time. And you know what? I was really sincerely happy for her. And I hope something beautiful comes of that new budding romance. She's just started with so much passion and enthusiasm. People deserve that after the, the, the shit show we've been put through in the last four years. Even if we hadn't been put through the COVID epoch, we still deserve to have, you know, true love and romance and passion and sweetness in our lives. Mama T has spoken. Yes, Charlie. You don't know what romance and passion is, Charlie, since you reject all the wild boy birdies. But it's a very nice thing when it's heartfelt and genuine and authentic and you can get it, just saying. Mm-hmm. So my beautiful friend comes up to chat to me and um, he, he, he's so sweet. He said, how have you been this week, Tanya? I hope you've been happy and healthy. I said, I'm always happy and healthy, Scott, when I'm not dying. Did I say that already? Did I repeat myself? Anyway, I think I did. But I, I am, I'm, I'm not dying this week. I'm exhausted, but I'm not dying. I only had um, three hours, two hours and 40, 48 minutes sleep this, this morning. 
I got home at about three, three, yes, it was about three, and uh, all my joints ached and my, my feet ached because, yeah, dumbass Mama T wore her stiletto shoes again. Oh, dear goddess. Queen of inappropriate footwear, sort of like being queen of the damned, really. But it's self-inflicted. I can't blame it on anyone else but myself. It was, it, I always, I always seem to do this. I want to go down in a blaze of glory looking elegant and glamorous and a bit sexy, you know, for as long as I can because ageing happens to everyone but I, I guess I'm still fighting it on, on the level of the, the footwear issue anyway. I've kind of accepted it in every other aspect but I still like to have nice shoes, people. But anyway, um, so I got home and uh, oh, before I got home, when I was leaving the club, Richard, the security guard, said, you're coming back tomorrow, Tanya. So excited. I said, oh, love, no, I don't think so. I'm absolutely crippled. And the first thing I did was kick off my shoes. And I said, but don't worry, I said, I said I can't possibly dance two nights at the moment because, you know, it's too much for me with my health, I said. But I'm working up to it. I'm building up stamina. I'm working up to the time maybe in the next few months when I might even come out on Saturday nights too. He was like, oh, that's really good. Oh, that's so lovely. Oh, they really love me in that club. They, I've never been made so welcome and treated like a VIP. Oh, yeah, that's what I wanted to tell you. While I was standing in the queue, you know, sussing out the beautiful young lovers in front of me, the young younger woman that joined the queue behind me turns to me and she says, oh, look, you, you dress like a VIP. I don't know if that's code for something. That maybe I'm old school and I'm interpreting it that they mean very important person and maybe they mean some other slang or code maybe it's meant to be insulting I don't think so and she touched my flowers with my flower on my hair when I go out and she says oh and you've been wearing your flowers she says, you're all VIP are you a VIP every weekend someone someone asks me if I'm a VIP right it's a bit odd so I said to her no love no I'm not a VIP she was like oh really because you look like you're a VIP to me so I kind of smiled at her and I said, well, that's really lovely that you think that, darling. I said, but let's be real here. If I were a VIP, it would be very uncouth for me to even admit to being one. I said, do VIPs admit to being VIPs or do they just go about the business of being VIPs? It was kind of like, one of those rhetorical questions, right? Because I certainly am not a VIP. But anyway, it was hilarious. And she goes, oh, high five, love. She goes, I like how you think. She says, that is such a VIP answer. I'm convinced you're a VIP now. It's like they just won't let it go, right? But I have to say, Mama T, the Tanya, the psychedelic dreamer, is treated like a VIP in that club. It's a bit astonishing. And look, all I do is show up, dance like a shamaniac, shaman, maniac on acid. Don't do drugs, though, people. On four Jack Daniels, and go home exhausted. There's nothing. There's nothing particularly VIP or extraordinary about that. But I guess it's my stamina. It's probably my stamina. They probably look at me and see this little old lady moshing out, going off to the wild rock music, and they're like, my God, how does she do it? Sometimes I have to ask myself that question too, usually in the ensuing three days when I'm in recovery mode. So anyway, but I had a wonderful time. Um, at one point at, at, towards the end of the night, I was sitting with a, a, a younger man beside me, he was very friendly and affable, and another redhead man on my left of me who was like looking a bit under the weather, quite frankly, and looking a bit 
you know when you're so drunk you sort of don't know whether you're going to pass out or just anyway and then a, a, a regular very petite little woman came and sat between beside me between me and the other man she was sweet I was fanning her because she looked like she was a bit I said are you all right love and she's like she was enjoying me fanning her which was quite delightful you know I don't mind sometimes I don't mind they don't demand me to fan them like I'm one of their freaking slaves and I don't mind you know sharing my fan with them a bit you know she was sweet and um so I turned to the um the, the, uh, the affable friendly man on to my right um he's I don't, oh that's right we to I, I bought a drink and we toasted each other and he said cheers and I said l'chaim because I, I always say l'chaim it's a habit of a lifetime and he went l'chaim and I went yeah to life I always toast to life mate I said also, I said, it's my Jewishness slipping. And he went, Jewish? And I went, yeah. And so I pulled up my very long maxi dress, which, by the way, got saturated in alcohol early in the night because some drunk man tipped a whole tray of drinks all over me. I was fair pissed off about that. But, oh, well, carried on dancing. What can you do? You know, every week something gets sloshed on me, but that was a lot of liquid poured over me like four or five drinks worth by the gods. So I was a bit annoyed about that. And also I was cold and wet for the first hour and a half till the dancing dried me out a bit. Anyway, but beside the point, so the, the chap he was talking to at the end of the night, I said to him, look, I said, I'll show you my Jewishness. It's my petticoat. It's slipping. And I lifted up my dress to show him the little white lace of my petticoat. And just at that point, Scott from Old Eagles is playing guitar and he's looking at me. He's like, what? <laughs> he's like, pull on the dress. Show some bloke my petticoat, which was hilarious because I wasn't flirting. I was just emphasising that my Jewishness was slipping like a slipped petticoat. It was a joke, which... You know, the chappy next to me understood perfectly well. We had a good laugh. And he says, oh, I want to say, hail Satan. I said, oh, why ever would you invite that God for? I said, especially to someone who's just announced to you that I'm Jewish. He says, I don't know. It's a heavy metal thing to do. I says, well, you could at least invite Lucifer then. He goes, what? And I went, yeah, Lucifer. I've just discovered in recent memory that Lucifer isn't the evil devil that's been made out by, you know, Orthodox Judaism and Christianity. What, he says? I went, no, apparently Lucifer was an ancient pagan god and was, you know, a god of light. His name in, um, in, in Roman times was Phosphor which is kind of interesting because I mentioned about the phosphor bombs dumped on Hamburg, Germany, that my mother narrowly escaped by virtue of being billeted down in the south. So anyway, there's that phosphor word, that white emanating, almost blinding light, the blinding white light of illumination and consciousness. And uh, when you... Uh, when you suddenly get an idea completely gifted to you, inspiration out of out of the blue, like literally from your muse, that is that version of Lucifer, that kind of Luciferian moment where there's a light shone in, in the darkness. It's like switch goes off and yeah. Anyway, so I said to him, yeah, I'd rather you invite the ancient pagan god Lucifer than Satan. I said, trust me, I've had enough satanic shit in my life. I don't want to wallow in that negativity. And I said, also, I said, I don't want you seeding your soul. He says, you're too late. I said, what do you mean? He says, I'm a redhead. I don't have a soul. And the guy, the, the chappy that was half out of his mind beside me on my left was a redhead too. So I looked at him and I, looked, I said, well, I'm fucked then. He says... What, what do you mean, Tanya? I says, well, when I was born, I was born with Tisha and red hair and um, I'm a bottle blonde now, and you know, but I said I, my original hair colour was bright, bright red. I said, I've still got the skin and the freckles to show for it. And he laughed 
He said, so how's your soul? I said, oh, I'm holding on to it for what, whatever scraps of it are left. I said, I'm holding on to it for what it's worth. I said, but don't worry. I'm a very ecumenical sort of person. In my worldview, everyone fits, even, you know, the dark ones. I said, it's a big, big multiverse. I said, but just be careful who you invoke in my presence because uh, I'm very cautious about that. Oh, Charlie, that was naughty. I said, I'm very cautious about these things after the lifetime of literally living in hell. And he laughed and I laughed. Nice young man, very nice. Gee, I met some lovely people last night. Everyone was happy. And there was another um, man that called Anthony that said hello to Scott that was hammy with me to songs. And very sweet, very nice. So, um, yeah, I haven't slept much, so I'm going to be cray, 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 crazy, crazy as fuck, probably later on today or tomorrow. I might not be. If I get a good night's sleep, I'll be, I'll be all right. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, mum, 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 mum. Yeah, I sat up last night until about eight o'clock painting my um, amulet that my, my beautiful, hmm, I did adore him and his family, um, Dr. John Bradley, who became Associate Professor John Bradley, made me an amulet for literally for my protection in 2002. And uh, uh, it had, had, over time it had got smeared from when I wiped the dust off and all the, the ink had, you know, smeared. So. Are you going to poo? So I spent a lot of time last night. I thought I brought the schmutter in, but I didn't. Um, I spent a lot of time last night painting that. I'll show it to you while I go and get the cloth for her. Madam's bum holy. I could have sworn I brought the cloth in. The schmutter, I call it. In Yiddish, it's a schmutter. Schmutter, schmutter. No, it's still here. Schmutter. Forgot it crazy you can tell i'm sleep deprived when i don't don't function all that well but yes so i spent um i'm still not finished let me get it in the light how can i do it i'll bring it in the lounge i've got to watch that madam doesn't chew on it though this is very very deeply precious to me because my friend John Bradley is an anthropologist. Someone said he's passed away now. I'm, I'm shocked because he wasn't that much older than I. I don't know when he passed away or even if that's true. But um, anyway, wherever you are, John, in the space con time continuum, Mama T still loves you. Um, so he made this for me. And it's a blessing in, in Hebrew. It says, may you be blessed in uh, your eyes and in the eyes of God and in the eyes of your daughters and little did he know that my children would end up both being estranged but shit happens or rather shits happen but look it's just so beautiful so I spent a lot of time painting the background white because the paper had all gone smeared and awful and I tried to paint in between the Hebrew lettering and it's it's looking a bit beige, so I might have to go back in and because I watered down the paint too much and um, redo the, the background just in this centre part. Anyway, um, Lev, Lev at the top, Lev means heart, it's, and Lev, it's also uh, the, um, the last letter, Lamed. Is the last letter of the five books of Moses, the Torah, and Vait or Bait, um, which forms the V part of Lev, Lev, is the first letter of Genesis that starts off the Torah. So it's all very symbolic and beautiful, like the Alpha and the Omega is the, uh, the Greek version of that. The beginning and the end, of course, where there is no beginning and there is no end. And I note he wrote my name down in Hebrew 
in um, three times. Very potent blessing. And it normally lives beside my bed and I haven't put it in a frame all the years like an idiot. So it got all got all manky. I've got to redo the red lettering. I'm just going over what he how he had um, done the calligraphy. I'm just literally painting exactly over it. And I redid the, the, the blue yesterday, metallic blue and the lev at the top in the darker blue and I, I've got to do the black I just outlined all the black lettering and um, I've wanted to do this for like years and each time I hesitated it was like I was scared that I might damage or destroy it because it's almost like a holy relic to me to be honest it's um, it's an it's an, a magical amulet done in a Kabbalistic style and it's such a blessing here he even signed it and did it, he did it in September 2002. And it's such a blessing and I'm just so, so grateful. So grateful to him to um, give me that magical protection, right? Because by the gods, back in those days I needed, I needed to pull out all stops and you can't, certain things you can't do for yourself. I mean, I've, I've done my own kind of exorcisms and my own magical practice but having someone do it for you from literally from their own heart and soul wanting you to prosper and have true love and safety and happiness and you know better health all those prayers would have been put into this when he wrote this for me so it's 2024 so it's taken 22 years but it's starting to manifest beautiful people of earth it's starting to manifest so um and i I, mean, I am grateful and i am happy and i'm grateful and happy to be doing that up and i'm going to put it in a nice frame so i can preserve it for another 22 years or however long the gods allow me to stay alive on this planet and uh, I brought Charlie in because it's so bloody windy outside. It's a real witchy wind, but it's a, it's a hot wind because it's a hot day. But look at the trees all bowing in the, in the wind. And it's, um, yeah, astonishingly windy. But uh, it's all good. Anyway, so on that lovely, happy, windy note, let us begin today's readings of even date. And uh, let's try and set this up so it... it's windy, so the door cracked open. It's not spirits, people, it's the wind. For a brief moment, I thought, oh, here we go. But no, no, no. Bear in mind the kitchen windows are open and there's nothing supernatural happening here right now, except for Mama T. Being in fine, fun, fatal, glory and happiness and joy and bliss from the wild. The wild joyous dance with my wild joyous men and uh, some beautiful women around me last night too. I guess at one point I met a woman, her name was Megan, and uh, she says, oh, I've just been out with my, my women friends very wild rock rock chick, young younger women dancing wildly. And she says, We've all been out all day to celebrate International Women's Day. I said, Oh, happy International Women's Day to you, my darling. She says, I know, but I wore these really high shoes. My feet are killing me. And so she puts her foot out to show me her shoe. So I kick out my leg to show her my shoes. And we high-fived each other. I said, I hear you, sister. I'm crippled myself. <laughs> but I tell you what, we both had really gorgeous legs. I mean, hers were slimmer than mine because she's slim. But we both had these gorgeous legs on display. And I'm like looking around and going, oh, yes. Oh, yes. We are so sexy. We are so sexy. On International Women's Day, we are wearing the crippling stilettos. We are the anti-feminists. We should be wearing sensible shoes. <laughs> like fuck we will. But anyway, we will. We will. Eventually I will. I'll have to submit. But 
Um, I usually, uh, recent weeks, I've just been wearing my lovely bohemian, um, you know, flat uh, crisscross leather Roman sandals with all the little pom-poms. And, oh, they're just gorgeous. I love those shoes. Absolutely love them. But anyway, last night I felt like, because uh, I had the long, elegant black dress, I just felt like zhuzhing it up with the, my favourite shoes. Uh, anyway, the, Megan says, I love your shoes. I said, $4 in an op shop, love. She said, what? And I went, these shoes are infamous. I've had elitist cunts in my own Jewish community mock and deride me for these shoes. And she laughed. I said, and the best revenge is happiness, darling, because these gorgeous shoes that they were so spiteful and envious of, only cost me four dollars. She said, Queen, we high fived each other. Oh yes, Mama T. Even in my abject poverty is a queen indeed. And uh elitist, snobby, condescending, patronizing, disgusting, abusive, vile cunts don't ever, ever wash with me. Because I was raised by them, darlings. I know exactly what kind of people you are when you behave like that. Narcissists are always, always at their core, very broken and damaged, cuntish people. So, that don't impress me much. But anyway, we had to laugh, this lady and I. She said, good on you, girlfriend. I said, amen, sister. Mama T is a queen in my own um, in my own uprising, in my own destiny, and in my own energy center meridians. But shh, don't tell everyone, or they'll all want some. Anyway, on that note, today's <laughs> I'm joking, people. Well, I'm only half joking. I'm a little bit serious too. Can you tell? But anyway, um, today's memories. Uh, entitled 9th of March 2024 which I can't update the date to 2024 in the vocal media without having to completely copy and paste the entire thing so this the, if you look for my writings and vocal media it will still say 2023 and um, I'm kind of protesting by not updating everything because then the AI rejects my stories that were already published and starts picking out bits and pieces and eating into it and things disappear and that just grinds my gears, people. Do not silence me and do not delegitimize my truth. Do not censor me. Do not edit me. If I'm going to edit my own self out, it'd be like, <coughs> done in my own quiet way. Don't need any malfeasant, artificial, intelligent freaking thing to interfere in my creativity and my um, my uh, journalistic uh, truth-telling of my own experiential awareness, right? But it happens from time to time that they've removed things and sometimes I don't notice and then I go back to look at things and there's a whole entire story gone and because if I haven't copied it somewhere else, it's gone forever, right? And I tell you what, if you want to enrage me, you just eliminate whole swathes of my lived experience. Like, I actually kind of really empathise with people who have dementia and Alzheimer's because losing your memory and your sense of self and your identity and everyone around you, and that is, that is the worst possible hell. It's like being edited out by some malfeasant AI creature just blankety blanking you out except when you're too far gone and Alzheimer's you don't even know that that's happened anymore so you lose the rage right but in the beginning those patients are always so enraged because they know something's missing but they can't quite identify what it is the frustration is immense so that's the other reason why I constantly record my life histories or what my events each week or each day and assiduously drag up sometimes quite excruciatingly painful trauma memories 
because they're all part of what makes me who I am, right? You, I could press block and delete and edit and remove, but the reality is no matter how much you delete, block or try and um, obfuscate or deny, you're still you. you still got to, you know, it's still formed you. That's my philosophy on things anyway. But I'm a, at my core a deeply loyal, loving person and I'm very loyal even to my own my own truths and my own ideas about things sometimes. It's a hill I'll die on, my own truth. Quite convinced of that actually. Excuse me, Charlie, you just did a poopy kiss. Alright, here we go. Yes, I know. You want him to just poo everywhere and be naughty. So today's readings are entitled um, Twisted Trauma Memories. I know, I know, it's endless. But happiness, happiness, people. Building my beautiful life one story at a time. And uh, speaking about a beautiful life, this is where I grew up in Island Bay, Wellington. It's titled Wellington Live. Island Bay is looking a bit tropical today. <laughs> Whoever wrote that did that tongue in cheek. Island Bay is fed by the Antarctic streams flowing into Cook Strait and is always a very, very cold and windy place. But I must say, in this photo, it does look indeed tropical and exquisite. You could almost mistake it for being, I don't know, downtown Noosa or something like that. And I, if I look carefully, I'll be able to show you where my actual house is, my childhood home, right? I think it might just be a little bit out of frame, but hang on. <clears throat> so I'll show you the whole photo. And then I'll show you where my childhood home is roughly situated. Island Bay. And yet just out of shot is Tapu Tauranga, which means sacred island. It's sacred to the Māori people. There's the little fishing boats here. Still, still operated by the Sicilian families. The descendants, no doubt, of the Sicilian fishermen that were there operating the fisheries when I was a child. And uh, let me see, I'm just in this corner here, you can just see one edge of it. I'm trying to get the, my camera to focus. There's the edge of Tapu Tauranga, which I used to get in a dinghy with my older friend who was four years older than me. Lynn Robertson, and we would row a boat to Tapu Tauranga. And believe that, for little kids, rowing a little wooden dinghy was actually quite a long distance to um, to row. It was quite a it was quite an undertaking. I found it quite strenuous anyway. I was probably about seven or eight at the time. So uh, over here is what they call Goat Island. Can, uh, can't see if you can see. Hang on. Go island here. Just the edge of it. It's a long flat island. And at the low tide, we used to call this the first channel and the second channel. The sort of a rocky outcrop in between. But at low tide we would walk across to Goat Island. Um, when the tide was low, you could walk across. And uh that's where in the second channel walking across to Goat Island, Goat Island, was where when I was seven I got grabbed around the ankle by an octopus and it wouldn't let me go. And I screamed and I screamed and I fucking screamed because I was so freaked out about being having an octopus grab grabbed onto me and wouldn't let go. I mean it couldn't really hurt me but to my child's mind I was freaked out that I couldn't shake it off or get rid of it. So um <clears throat> all the neighborhood men came running. They all all of them, three or four of them. What's wrong, Tony? Oh, the boss is grabbing. I can't 
They won't let go. Anyway, they had to peel her off me. It had all its little suckers grabbing onto me. And quite frankly, that was karma for all the times my father brought octopi home in a bucket and got me to poke their little suckers and play with them, basically to learn how they would latch on and latch off. But um, yeah, I, I got paid back karmically for that quite quite resonantly. Anyway, up um so you come here's the, the park here. <clears throat> And here is like where the rotunda used to be when I was a child. The Salvation Army used to bring their brass band instruments and play there. And um, I, across the street, one, two, three, this house here. Don't know if you can make it out. Anyway, that was the house that we moved into. Cases building had a butcher shop underneath and uh, another shop that he turned into a gift shop and ran a little gift shop there and we lived upstairs and that building was called the Zuno buildings um, from the Zuno family which would have been one of the fishing families uh, Sicilian fishing families anyway that's on the parade and that was 351 the parade and I used to bring my horse in that little alleyway there and sit in the back backyard there to eat the grass. And uh, yeah, so that was his home that he bought with his inheritance case. But before, just after we migrated to Brisbane actually, that house had to be um, reinforced and renovated because it was um, due to be demolished because it was an earthquake risk. So uh, the person that built it had to reinforce it with steel or whatever to make an earthquake sound. So anyway, so I spent, I lived in that home from the ages of 14, 14 I think I was when they bought it, or 15, 14 I think I was, and until I got married when I was 19 and one month. What an idiot. But anyway, I was in love and I thought my husband was a kind, jolly, happy-go-lucky, sweet person. And I married in good faith and boy, did I find out the hard way. But anyway, look, he wasn't too bad in the beginning until I had the children and it kind of escalated from there. But he wasn't too bad. He only hit me once six months into the marriage. I said, you ever lay a hand on me again, I'll cut your throat and watch you bleed to death in our marital bed. So he never dared hurt me again because he knew I was deadly serious, but he was vicious in so many other ways. It was like, I don't know why I even bothered to threaten him. I should have just packed up and walked out then and there. I would have only been married him when I was 19 and one month, so I would have been 19 and seven months, still young and beautiful, might have found a, a beautiful, loving, genuinely loving husband. No, I stayed with that dead shit and had two babies with it. So can you see why I'm a bit pissed off now that I'm old and how life wasn't really fair and choices I made didn't really pan out and, you know, it is what it is. It's a life, people, but by the gods... That's why I'm so determined to make sure that if I get involved in a permanent love partnership, again, that it's someone who genuinely adores me this time and has my back and my front and my sides and is non-violent and non-aggressive and, you know, genuinely values me and cherishes me as a person because I'm done living in those kind of fucking hell loops that, just end up with me being suicidal or at times homicidal for good reason, you know. But anyway, life is beautiful, darlings. There's Island Bay. I'll show you where my original childhood home, which was the first, wasn't the first home I lived in because we moved there when I was a baby. I think I was about one when we moved there. My first home was in a, a, a house called in Holloway Road in Tiaro, very close to Wellington City actually. And um, 
I was uh, lying in my crib there as a young baby, about six months, seven months old, and there was a massive fucking landslide and look, took, took out most of my, my bedroom, my nursery, missed me by about two feet. That was another near-death experience where half the fucking house went down the hill in a landslide. So, um, you know, my, my mother sold that house and bought this house in Island Bay. So that house, you can't quite see it in, in the frame. It's just a little bit out of the frame. But see all that rocky outcrop there? I used to play all in, in amongst all those rocks and... Um, in the rock pools, always looking for little fishes, and the Māori people would come and they would collect pāwa and kina, and kina's like sea urchin, very spiky, horrible looking fucking things, and they actually crack them open and it's got a gigantic looking egg and they actually, you know, swallow it whole. And oh, my friend Lynn tried it once and she projectile vomited for, a, for hours. I was like, what you do that for? And she goes, well, they seem to enjoy it. But I said, oh, darling, that's not for us. That, that fuck, that's not Pakiha food, kinna. Anyway, all the Maori people would be laughing when they hear me say that because oh, it's just the most revolting thing. But anyway, for some reason, I suppose it's an acquired taste. If you, if you can swallow a kinna whole, babies, you can swallow anything, just saying. But anyway, just out of frame here, on the very corner was my childhood home. And so I grew up looking, looking out to sea, watching the whales come up and down in, in the warmer months in summer and watching the inter-island ferry make its crossing to Picton in the South Island twice a day. So as you can see, it was an absolutely, was and still is an absolutely beautiful place. And I would have had an idyllic childhood had it not been for my fucking filthy family of origin. But anyway, so it's kind of bittersweet to look at that photo. It's like so many good memories, but so many bad memories too, which I literally have to um, push away and think of nice things like my childhood friends and all the freedom we had running we lived on that beach we lived on it that was our mother and our father that that was our safe haven we, we'd go home to eat and sleep and we weren't safe in our own homes well I wasn't um Lynn to a lesser degree you know had a little bit more safety because she had a beautiful loving mother and her father was okay when he was sober, but that wasn't often, though. But he was, he could be abusive, I suppose. He could be abusive, especially to his wife, but um, she didn't get the, um, the sexual abuse like I had growing up in my family home. So, and the violence and the, the constant screaming and aggression, it was just, it was a hell. It was a hell what I have survived. So when you see me out dancing wildly and mushing and throwing myself into the music, it's therapy for me, people, because um, uh, I guess my spirit uh, still craves that kind of that rebellion and that defiance and that wildness um, and losing myself and getting into the, the zone, the trance zone and into the music it's very very cathartic and it's good therapy for me uh, even as a child I would stand on that beach and I would literally didn't know the word mosh when I was a child but I would literally mosh and tribal dance even then and uh, there was a photo of me doing that that Lynn had taken when, when I was a little girl I was about seven, so she was about 11, and I still remember her taking the photo. She took it with an antique box brownie and um, got quite annoyed with me because I wouldn't stand still long enough to pose because I was moshing as hard as I could. And she said, what are you doing, Tanya? I still remember it. And I said, I'm dancing out the demons, Lynn. What do you think I'm doing? So I've been doing this, dancing out the demons for a very, very long time since I was seven years old 
and I'm almost 59 now. So what's that? 52 years of tribal stomping and moshing. Um, so that's that's my spirit fighting back from literally from the brink of death and dancing out the evil ones and the, the negativity and the um, the dibbukim, the, the soul-ridden fucking entities of my, my progenitors and um, whatever other entities they drew in with their constant communications on the Ouija board and my mother's black magic hoodoo spells and all that shit they drew in that affected me as a child, right? So there is that, but um, I'm a I'm a natural born shaman, and a, a natural born witch with natural witch lineage. So there's a reason why I'm a little bit unusual, people, <laughs> and that comes with its own blessings and its own curses, which I'm very well aware of, and uh, kind of keep a even keel on it at all times and uh, stay in the light people but uh, anyone who knows me well knows it does not behoove them to uh, needle me or poke at me and get me angry and get me into a state and uh, quite sure Irish Murphys will have worked out by now that what they did to me and got away with has not behooved them at all so it's kind of amusing in a way that Scott want, wanted me to go back and dance there for his gigs in that, that venue because uh, as much as I love Scott and Alter Egos and I, I love to dance for their band and Ramjet, um, who also play at Irish Murphy's, it's like, uh, do not interfere in my witchy curses because uh, it's very rare that they get put in place and they're there for a reason, people. And uh, it would be a very, very stupid and dangerous thing for me to do to renege on one of my own curses that were placed there, not just for my protection, but also for the protection of others and to... Um, they have to pay. They have to pay for that fucking karmic debt of what they they did to me and other beautiful women who didn't actually do anything to deserve that treatment, by the way, except dance and be a bit wild. And when things were getting particularly seedy on particularly dangerous nights, uh, Mama T would invoke the angels and the place would get cleaned up almost instantaneously. So there was that. Well, Mama T withdrew her angels. Mama T takes her angels everywhere she goes, mind you, but she does not call upon them lightly, as I said in another video. And uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe they look at me as some kind of good luck charm or mascot or, you know, some pity or pitiable creature. Who knows how they really look at me, but... At the end of the day, I know my own heart and my own magic. And that's all that matters, babies. Nothing else matters. Growing up on that wild beach with uh, Papa, Tuanu Papa Tuanuku, Mother Earth, and Tangaroa, you know, the god of the sea. And um, those, those were my parents. Those were my gods, even though I'm not Māori. And I do have a Māori cousin whose ancestors were chiefs who actually communicated with me quite astonishingly in Māori back in 2020. Um, but I, I, I can't claim that heritage because, uh, you know, my, my, my side of the family were all, you know, German, Polish, Irish, English, Scottish... And, uh, but yeah, never, never piss me off, people. You're dealing with ancient Celtic gods and ancient Teutonic gods as well. So, um, you know, and I, I, growing up in New Zealand with all that raw beauty and wildness and nature, and, you know, I did at times as a, as a child call upon 
the spirits of the land, the Māori spirits of the land. And uh, trust me, when you develop a relationship with um, the land and the sea spirits, of even though it might not be your own, um, you know, uh, innate uh, DNA, but you grow up in that culture and you're immersed in that culture, trust me, they do come to assist you, you know, if you speak to them, with, of course, with due respect and reverence. I spent many a, many a time when I, my horse was bought for me when I was 14 years old by my pedophile godfather, little, little unbroken 18-month-old pony, you know, little filly she was. Um, and uh, I spent many, many, many months, years even, trekking through the hills over in Happy Valley, which was one suburb over, further over again. You're almost two suburbs over, past o o Ophero Bay. You know, I used to have to walk all the way from Island Bay, all the way up Ophero Bay Road, all the way up. It's how I came to meet my husband's father, by the way, when I fell off my horse one time, when I was 15. But anyway, I'd walk all that way up and then I'd have to go from the adjustment paddock where I kept my horse all the way up, way, way up into the hills, looking for the little bugger. Sometimes it would take me two, three hours of walking to find her. And uh, along the way, because my childhood was so god-awful and actually not really survivable, even my psychiatrist said to me, I don't know how you didn't suicide as a child or a teenager. He said, you astonish me how strong you are and the things you have survived. And I nodded. But I can credit that to, A, having that beautiful beach to be raised by and the spirits there, and being up in the hills as a teenager, talking to the spirits of the land, the, um, the ancient ones uh, of Aotearoa, I suppose they're Māori spirits, although they probably would have predated even the Māori people coming to New Zealand. But anyway, um, I used to commune with the spirits there and I used to pray to them and please help me just survive this and help me find a way out of this and help me have a safe and loving life and be surrounded by good, kind, loyal, loving people who value, cherish and adore me. And so I had that manifestation and prayer out even when I was 14 years old, 15 years old, 16 years old, 17. So you can imagine by the time I met my husband at 17 and uh, fell in love with him rather stupidly, but what can I say, I was only a teenager. And uh, I fell in love with Judaism and I wanted to be Jewish and I actually thought with great delight and happiness that I'd finally found my tribe, right? People that would love me and honour me and treat me with deep respect and sweetness and kindness. And so you can imagine the horror I felt when all that turned to shit and instead I was vilified and slandered, especially when I moved here to Brisbane in 1988. It was utter evil what was done to me because it was that important to me to have my safe family life and my own babies and my husband and my culture, my Jewish culture and religion, go to temple regularly and pray to the Holy One and all manifestations and to be part of a, a place where I was where I belonged and where I was accepted and loved and cherished. And for a while that was the case in Wellington, New Zealand. I was well loved and respected and cherished in my temple there in um, Temple Sinai. Um, but when I came here it all turned to shit in a hand hell in a handbasket. So anyway, <clears throat> that was then, this is now, 35, almost 36 years later, here I am, 
Mama T, no longer honouring and observing the Shabbat on a Friday night, but out wildly dancing with wild rock bands, living my best life. So I reverted to my inner childish spirit of being wild and free and uncompromising on giving up on that freedom and uh, love of music and love of nature. And I guess my witchy ways too kicked in. More and more they kicked in, but in particular after my suicide attempt in 2015 and um, in the ensuing years after that, and then again 2019. In fact, one of my friends, after I survived that terrible gallbladder surgery on 25th of June 2019, and I was still going out with like very bad pain in my side from where the drain had been put in, and uh, <clears throat> I turned up to West End Drumming and one of my friends that I knew from Ecstatic Dance, Noosh, turned to me. She says, you know, Tanya, you're a natural witch. I don't know why you're not living that lifestyle and honouring it because that's who you are. And I smiled and I said, I know, Noosh, I know. It's just very, very hard to leave behind my Judaism and my Jewish culture and my Jewish belief system because it's ingrained into me after you know 40 nearly 40 years you know literally so uh, it's more than 40 years now I was 19 when I converted officially but I'd started studying about Judaism when I was about 16 so yes it's hard to leave that behind it's hard to leave your Abrahamic God, that jealous God. I am my beloved, my beloved is mine. Cut me some slack, Holy One. I think he is. Thank you, Holy One. Indeed cutting me some slack and revealing to me true hearts and minds, people who genuinely see me and value and cherish me and adore me. and I'm, I'm so grateful for that too. My my men, my tribe, my people are finding me, and it's um it's a truly beautiful thing. Even though I remain a Jewish witch, it's a truly beautiful thing, and I am grateful. So um, I digressed a lot there, but I wanted to show you. Pardon me, I wanted to explain to you about Island Bay. And I had planned on going home early this early in early February, but I, I didn't. I ran out of money as I often do, so that was the end of that. But Lynn was so excited. She said, "I can't wait for you to come home." I was only going to come home for four days, people, and um, we were going to walk all along that seafront, all along that beach, and visit all the places that we used to, you know fossick amongst us children we were going to do the long hike it's five kilometer hike to red rocks and i said i want to see the walruses again and um just have like a nostalgic memory lane as if we were both six and seven and ten and eleven again and um we will do it if you watch my videos lynn roberts and i don't think she does but we will do it as soon as I get enough money, I'm coming home for four days and we will do that. And I hope it happens in the not too distant future because, you know, the way my health's been, I, I worry. <laughs> I worry I might not make it, but I, I will make it and we will do it. I'll be, I'm coming home for four days. If I can afford it, I'll come home for a bit longer. And uh, we will go and we will do all those beautiful things that we did as children, living wild and free in uh, Island Bay, Tapu Tehrana. So uh, I carry on, carry on with my readings. 9th of March, 2023. Lynn, not Lynn in New Zealand, but my Australian friend Lynn, spelled L-Y-N. I have two Lynns, two significant people in my life named Lynn. One was my childhood friend who was like a sister to me growing up 
and my beautiful friend Lynn here who I met when I migrated to um, when I bought my house in Birkdale actually. We were both pushing prams. Well she was pushing her her youngest child in the pram and Jasmine was fourteen months when we arrived, so she would have been about eighteen months or so when we met. And I was pushing her in a stroller and we got talking, befriended each other then. And we've been solid friends ever since and she too is like a sister to me. So uh, I've been very blessed in life with beautiful, heartfelt, sincere friends that more than made up for my shitty, fucking awful family. Trust me on that. Without those women in my life, I probably would not be alive today. So sad but true. Anyway, Lynn visited this Arvo and brought a drawing ointment for the boil I have on my upper back. She put it on the boil and also placed a bandage as I can't reach it myself. It ended up having to be cut out and it was epic. It was fucking, even the skin doctor was shaking and said this was much larger than I anticipated and it should have been done in a hospital. But never mind, we got through it and I healed. I do kind of have a hole in my back now, but oh well. Along with all the other scars from skin cancers, like what else is new? It is what it is, people. I had to survive many, many unpleasant things. But here we are. Anyway, we were trying to remove it, you know, with a poultice activity. So anyway, she put it on the boil with the drawing ointment and also placed a bandage as I can't reach it myself. She is coming back tomorrow to see if the drawing ointment has assisted the boil to be drawn to the surface. I feel quite unwell. Asthma and my left shin bone, which I smashed a few weeks ago. Where did I put that schmutter? Oh, there it is. She's poopy kind again. <clears throat> Um, which I smashed a few weeks ago, my shin bone. I dropped the hutch dresser on it. Hurts like hell. Oh well. <laughs> this is what I kind of need a man for, to help me move heavy furniture, right? Because Mama T goes into warrior goddess mode and says to herself, I can do anything! And I do, I do the unimaginable things. But I injure myself in the process. But like my old man in that respect. Single-minded and a bit stupid, right? Anyway. It, oh well, I say. At least the chronic upset tummy has eased. Oh dear goddess. That was bad last year, actually. That went on for weeks and weeks. I thought I was going to die. Another thing I didn't die of. It's what was so funny when Scott says to me, are you happy and healthy, Tanya? I said, I'm always happy and healthy when I'm not dying. <laughs> I mean, there comes a point when you just have to laugh. Anyway, I continue on. I'm hoping we can heal the boil without me having to get another large cut in my back. My back is full of skin cancer operation scars and looks awful. So if I can avoid yet another slash on my back, I will be grateful. Lynn also brought me meals to put in the freezer. She really is a sweetheart. She's so good to me. She is. Lamb shank bones and two big servings of spaghetti and meatballs. Chocolate and cake and even schmacko treats for Beauregard and two lorikeet treats for Charlie. Yes, we're talking about you, Charlie. I'm fortunate to have such a wonderful friend come to my aid when I am so unwell. I am indeed. 9th of March, 2021, 11, 11 p.m. Another synchronicity. Wow, the 11 numbers. See them a lot sometimes. It's quite astonishing. Yesterday I saw a new optometrist. He was lovely, kind, professional and warm. 
His entire family work in his business, mostly women who were also very kind and caring. He says I don't have macular degeneration at all and to even suggest that was theatrical. I am so relieved. However, I do have a tiny cataract, which he says they usually blow out around the age of 67. So I'm nearly 59, so I've got eight years to go. Hopefully it doesn't blow out until then or later. Hopefully. He says, I do have tiny spots on my eyes from sun damage. When I have the money one day, sigh, I will invest in polarised glasses. But I hate to think how expensive they would be. I didn't even ask. We ordered new lenses through the mass scheme which arrive in mid-April. Sometimes they arrive sooner. I bought purple frames. So what year was this? 21. So I'm definitely due for new glasses. That's three years ago, people. Jesus. Anyway, usually they actually send you a message and tell you that you're due to be checked out again, but I must have fallen off their system. I'll have to go and get them to review my eyeballs. Review my eyeballs. I bought purple frames with a kind of tortoise shell, and as you can see, they're broken, and I glued them together. Tortoise shell patterning on them, which I am paying off. Because you get free glasses through the mass scheme, but they always break within a week. So I bought these, they were $135, which was a lot when you don't have much money, people. And I paid them off, but oh, they've, they've got cracks there as well. And I'm um, far. Like, I really have to, I really have to deal with it soon. <clears throat> I'm very happy with my decision to find a new optometrist. He was a funny man. At one point when I told him I had gone blind for five days on an incorrect dose of cogentin, he said he bet I was happy I got my vision back and it was not permanent. I replied, fuck yes. He laughed and said that in Greek that those two words mean lentils, then proved it to me on Google Translation. I thought that was delightful. He had a beautiful photograph of a Greek island which I admired. He said both sets of grandparents had come from that tiny island and that even today only 500 people inhabit it. I remarked that everyone would have known each other's business but it was truly beautiful and it struck me that that island had produced such a beautiful family who was so very kind and decent. It warmed my heart greatly. And the scenery of the island that he came from looked a bit like Island Bay, only being in the Mediterranean, warmer, did look idyllic and gorgeous. So um, that was our soul connection, both coming from island living and from the sea, literally seafaring folk. So... 11.11am, 11, 11 angel messages, just love. I posted that photo again of Island Bay, but the smaller version of it. And uh, here's another view shot from helicopter. This looks more to me like going around to Red Rocks, Ophiro Bay, Island Bay is over here somewhere, and then you go around and then you, actually, no, I'm wrong, am I, am I wrong, or am I right? Yeah, I think that's Ophiro Bay. And then if you keep walking all around, all around, you come over here to Red Rocks. It's a five kilometre walk. It's a bloody long walk, people. But anyway, 
We did that often, my friend Lynn and I, escaping our family progenitors, living wild and free. And we would pack up potatoes wrapped in foil, and Lynn would always, because she was the older child, so she would always pack matches and take responsibility for the food. You know, oh, she really was a sweetheart. And she'd pack up little sausages and sometimes chopped onions, you know, and uh, matches. We always had something to make a fire on, on the beach, you know, like dry driftwood. And she would bring some paper as well, I think, to get us started off a bit. And we would go on these long, long treks, long hikes. And then we would stop and she'd build a little fire. And uh, we would put the, the potatoes in the foil inside the fire. And we would cook up the, the onions and the sausages. And that would be our lunch. Camping, kind of camping, but without camping, you know living wild and free on the beach like little wild spirits like two little heavenly creatures it was tempting to kill my family of origin at times too but we didn't do that needless to say but um when i saw that movie heavenly creatures which were about two little girls in christchurch that actually killed i think they killed one of their mothers if i remember the movie correctly I fucking freaked out because it was very similar dynamic to um, what was going on in our childhood. So anyway, um, we were heavenly creatures without descending into complete madness and homicide. And it was a very, very, very fine line we almost crossed though. And uh, that entity, my pedophile godfather, would have deserved it by the way. And I, I often wish, I often regret that we didn't kill him because it occurred to me much later in life that um, his predating on little girls and possibly boys as well would not have ended with me. Serial pedophiles are usually career pedophiles, goes on their entire lifetime and leave a trail of damage behind them. So yes, we should have ended his life, but... Uh, we didn't know what a brake line looked like, unfortunately. Or maybe fortunately, because some innocent person might have got killed in that car wreck had we known how to do it. But um, that's why I only half jokingly say, never fuck with the Tanya. Although you can all relax because I still don't know what a brake line looks like. I guess I could ask a mechanic though. No, seriously, I don't want to murder anyone, you know. I, I really don't, except maybe people like my, my godfather do not deserve to take up space on this planet, just saying. They're the only ones that deserve to die, literally, but only because of the devastation they wreak on innocent children's lives and the decades of complex trauma that arises from that. Anyway, happy th thoughts. Look at the beautiful blue sea and rejoice in freedom and happiness. Hard won and fought for. Literally every day and every way with every breath and every dance and every time I invite someone good and kind and loyal and loving into my life. That makes life worth living, right? So there is that. So to my beautiful souls that do love me and treat me with deep honour and genuine care and respect, I honour you also. So 9th of March 2020, I shared a meme. I am in charge of how I feel and today, I am choosing happiness. Yes, Tanya, you are always happiness. They try to kill that in you. Silence, strangle, rape, slander you. 
but you grew back your innate joy and exploded like a supernova. Never forget, happiness is the ultimate revenge. Smile. And uh, there were many times in my life when my smile was worn very thin, very strained, and I had to kind of fake it till I made it. But I've had many, many times in recent years when I smiled brightly and beautifully and authentically, and uh, I'm grateful for that. Once again, having my innate happiness brought back from my own spirit and the love extended to me by beautiful souls. A true happy smile and love with my beloved ones and with our earth and with our gods. It's miraculous and it's beautiful. I have finished the antibiotics. My breathing is 90% better. I am still assailed by weird coughing fits, but not as frequently. I hope and pray I am on the mend as it was such a long illness and I was becoming quite hysterical, living with Lady Death as a constant companion. I mean, well, she doesn't eat much or talk much, but she was merging with my light body to the extent that my breathing was getting shallower and I was having trouble walking and was unable to do any housework or really feel at all alive. So when I finally called Azrael down, he had a good long look at me, held my hand, then sent me back into the fray. By the time I got to my doctor on Wednesday, Three days later, I was already swinging on the other side of the pendulum of fate and had 99% oxygen saturation, which didn't seem right. But those thumb monitors, I think they're called oximeters, are quite sciencey things and have literally saved my life before during a post the uh, gallbladder surgery it screamed so much because I'd stopped breathing and was actually literally on my last breath about to enter the next dimension when that thing screamed so much the nurse came running in and dragged me back from from the abyss literally which I was none too happy about at the time because it was a very peaceful passage and I was so grateful for that to finally be um, out of this life in such a beautiful peaceful way but no they sent me back because the gods want me to have my true love partner my success my happiness my better health and to achieve things for however long i, I merit to be alive on this planet and I fulfilled some of that mission coming back from that near-death experience by fighting hard against the COVID epoch. So I think the gods are well satisfied that I fulfilled that mission. But uh, they seem to want to keep me here. So on we go every day in every way. Loving life even though death and I are old buddies and pals. So now I'm getting better. I have three old hat boxes to finish painting and decoupaging. My mad writings to continue with, love to be made or co-created. The house is in darkness as it's a rainy cloudy day outside. I'm listening to the glistening, life-giving water pouring down to earth, and I am happy. Water is life. Today is Hannah Clark and her three children's funeral. My father's funeral also fell on this day three years ago, although I did not attend. 
I hope our government does something about the constant slaughter of women and children. I hope the foul handmaidens that I encounter who dare to call me victim are severely punished for their smug evil. You know who you are, bitches. I hope life gets better and safer for decent, innocent people in general. We need a paradigm shift before it's too late. I sense it might already be too late, but I have raised myself from my own gravel-rashed, tortured life at the 11th hour so many times, so I know the society can do the same. Choose life, choose goodness, protect and love those who are in need of safety with honour and integrity. Say no to abusers, regardless of gender or agendas. Stand tall, sisters, and I can add to that, brothers as well. Speak your truth, dance. Love yourself so beautifully, pardon me, that no foul, evil, perverted bastard can ever make you doubt yourself again. So you never feel you have to crawl away and lick your wounds like a beaten dog. Look them in the eye. Watch them wither. The gods have your back. Know it. Yes, Charlie. You sweetie baby. 9th of March 2019. I posted a meme and it's quite wonderful. I shared it again on my Facebook page. You are not everyone's cup of tea. The world is filled with people who, no matter what you do, no matter what you try, will simply not like you. But the world is also filled with those who will love you fiercely. The ones who love you, they are your people. Don't waste your finite time and heart trying to convince the people who aren't your people that you have value. They will miss it completely. They won't buy what you are selling. Don't try to convince them to walk your path with you because you will only waste your time and your emotional good health. You are not for them and they are not for you. You are not their cup of tea and they are not yours. Politely wave them along and you move away as well. Seek to share your path with those who recognize and appreciate your gifts, who you are. Be who you are. You are not everyone's cup of tea. And that is okay. And I don't have the author that wrote that, but it's very, very true. It was a lesson hard learned over eons. I eventually did learn it. Don't waste time trying to hold people in your life that are just false and feckless and sadistic and cruel and shallow and callow and lackluster and fucking NPC zombies. Just wave them on. Don't sup from that cup. It's got nothing to nourish you, baby girl. Not your cup of tea. So, <laughs> I posted this meme and I'll show you it's a photo. How I look, how I think I look after eating salad for lunch once. <laughs> Which is kind of funny as I had salad for breakfast lunch today. An early lunch, it was kind of a late breakfast. Um, 
had it about 11 o'clock this morning. I was hungry. Uh, so anyway, I reply to that meme. Me after five Jack Daniels and flicking off a dozen or so mouth-breathing Neanderthal predator creeps. Well, you have to laugh. I did used to flick them off too. Sometimes shoulder them off. I guess, I guess my men still want me to come back to Irish Murphy's because those, that was my heyday, darlings, when I wore my stiletto metal studded boots and uh, creepy men would get shouldered or flicked off and I was in constant warrior goddess hypervigilance mode, but it could be hilarious at times. But the amount of drunk men that used to literally jump on my back, like, who does that? And I have a very bad back. It's actually very fucking dangerous. One time some lout at Irish Murphy's jumped on my back. I wasn't wearing the studded um, stiletto boots. I was wearing platform boots that were like eight inch heels. They were platform though, and they were so well made that when he jumped on my back, I still had a center of gravity, which was astonishing because those boots, he should have knocked me off my feet. I'm sure that was his intention when he jumped on me, right? The malevolent dog. But anyway, I just, my bodice here, shoulder, and my very high boots. Had a few Jack Daniels under my belt, which gives me a bit of um, armoring as well. And I, <laughs> this fucking monkey on my back. He wasn't a monkey, but he was about about my height. He was solid. He was a man. Anyway, he's on my back, and I just shouldered over to the stage, turned around, shucked him off, and danced back back into the crowd again. Turned around and looked at him. Went. It was. People were crying with laughter. They were. That was. It was so fucking funny what I did. But he was an asshole jumping on my back, my very bad back. Could have crippled me. Anyway. So other reasons to not want to go back to Irish Murphy's were, apart from the disrespect and dishonour of the management and ownership, was, um, oh, Charlie. It was um, physically very debilitating and dangerous because it was a wild, feral frickin' pub. And... Um, People were, you know, drunk and disorderly and uh, would try to literally, literally did do on a couple of occasions, jump on, jump on my back. It's just rude people, very rude. It's just fortunate that I always carry excess weight and uh, although I'm not a particularly athletic or fit person, I don't do gyms for example, I'm actually quite strong. And powerful in my core magically as well as kind of physically that's when I'm not dying of some illness at the whatever point in time it is even back then I was struggling with a lot of health issues so um, I'm still loved and admired for my wild dance is what I'm telling you and my wild witchy ways and my ability to um, shuck off the the dead shits mid mid dance. <laughs> oh dear goddess. Well, I'm getting older now. I need peace and quiet for my old age. I need a truly loving partner to kiss and cuddle. Not public displays of affection like that young couple in front of me last night. But they they were brand new. They were excited and brand new, you know, and younger. But you know. Just someone sweet for my old age. Someone to get old with gracefully. Wouldn't that be nice? It's not going to happen. I'm going to be rock chicking for quite some time, I can tell. Definitely rock chicky babying for quite some time. Especially now, they want me to go to even more gigs. We'll see how we go, babies. If I, if I can summon up the energy and the... The will, I'll keep doing it. You keep playing music, I'll keep dancing, my beautiful ones. 
So, um, but I don't want any contracts with the devil. Don't don't wear me out too much. Bear in mind, I'm I'm older than you. Anyway, we'll see how we go. I'm happy about it for now. As long as I don't get sicker and weaker, then I then I'll have to give up my dancing. I suppose the time will come. Charlie, I don't know how you did that, but there's lumps of shit all down me, even in my dress. Like, they're quite solid little lumps. Usually it's all squirty, runny stuff. What have you done, Charlie? Come here, look, she's sitting on my knee. All right, you can sit on my knee, it doesn't matter. Busy Arvo, I nailed the back on one of my china cabinets as best as I could. The back is shitty chipboard, so it's swelling. Ugh. Cooked myself a chicken tagine, then just took... Feels like it's in my hair too. This is life with a rainbow lorikeet, people. Keeps me humble. Then just took Charlie and Beauregard for a walk around the block. Now my foot hurts and I still have dancing tonight. <laughs> I might need a bit of a rest beforehand. Oh, and I trimmed Bo Bobo's forelocks, you know, that tufts he got between his eyeballs. He could barely see out of them and looked like a weird scruffy alien dog. 11, 11 a.m., make a wish. So here's the funny thing, right? Talking about needing a rest before I go dancing. Every Friday, every Friday without fail, unless I'm really, really too old to go out, right? Every Friday without fail, this is my pattern, I get busy doing something creative or I get distracted with something. So then I'm quite tired. So it gets to about 7 or 8 o'clock and I'm quite tired. Like yesterday I was painting that beautiful amulet, you know, renovating the amulet from my beautiful friend John. And um, so it got to about 8 o'clock and I was like, man, I'm tired. I've been working, painting and, you know, renovating it all day, all afternoon. And oh, maybe I won't go dancing, I said to myself. So I thought, oh, well, I'll go and have a lie down for an hour, have a little sleep. So I set the alarm for 9 p.m. because I figured that an hour, an hour nap would be enough. And then 9 p.m. I go and I put on all my makeup and I do the eyeliner and I do the glitter eyeliner and I even put the beads in my hair, which is quite time consuming to thread all those on, right? It's a work of art, people, being a, a VIP icon. People keep saying I'm a VIP. No, and I'm not really an icon. Don't get me wrong. I'm not grandiose. I'm just an old lady going out living her best life. But anyway, but all the, the get up takes time, right? The um, the regalia, I call it. The shamanic reg regalia. I almost wore my top hat last night, but it's too hot. And I'm glad I didn't because since I had all those drinks poured all over me, if it had got on my top hat, I would have been fucking even more furious. But I might wear it when the weather cools down, but it's just where would I keep it without it being destroyed by drunken louts, right? Don't think it's good to wear to the club. It's nowhere to put your stuff. And I'd have to wear it all night and it gets hot. Anyway, musing, musing on. But anyway, I set my alarm for 9pm thinking, well, I'll get up at 9 and I'll put on the makeup and get ready and go. So I lay in my bed hoping to have a nap and actually close my eyes and sleep. As soon as I lay down, like I was body tired, my body felt tired, so my body was like, oh, it's so nice to lie down. But my brain went on fire, couldn't rest, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't shut off my mind to, to actually close my eyes and have a nap before I went dancing last night. And uh, so in the end, I thought, oh, well, fuck it. I'm not sleeping. I might as well get up. So I got up and got ready anyway. And just as well I did because I was running late to leave to go to the club. I didn't actually leave till about quarter past 10. And I usually try to leave about 10 to 10. 
So I was like, in the end, kind of hurrying to get, you know, my shoes on and, uh, you know, my jewellery on. I was like, what is wrong with me? Like, I was so tired, you would think that I would have just gone, bing, and then, you know, got up when, with the alarm. But no, no. And then last night, only having under three hours sleep, what is wrong with me, people? But anyway, I'm happy, I'm in love, and I'm happy. And um, for once in my life, I'm not dying. And uh, isn't that nice? <laughs> I mean, I have to laugh too. And, uh, you know, life is pretty good right now. So, 9th of March 2018. I just saw a wild rainbow lorikeet visiting Charlie on top of his outside cage. This was before we found out that Charlie is actually a girl when she laid her first egg in December 2020. Charlie, Charlie, that's you, Charlie, has a girlfriend or boyfriend. It flew away when I saw it as Bobo chased it. Oh, so I've clipped Charlie's wing as I'm scared to lose him to the call of the wild like I lost Jesse many years ago which was my first pet lorikeet who literally flew away and joined all the wild birds because he was horny. And, uh, well, I didn't know, did I? I didn't know that they're horny little birds. Anyway, Charlie's not horny. Charlie, Charlie hates all the wild birds equally. The new friend can visit and make birdie num 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 love with Charlie in his territory. Still waiting for my grandchildren, Charlie. <laughs> oh, dear goddess. I'm so happy for him. Enough freedom to have friends, but not so much that he risks dying in a flock of wild birds. 9th of March, 2017. Here's a cute little photo. It's why I reacted just when I said, still waiting for my grandchildren. And this photo of Bobo with his eyes looking astonished popped up and I was like yeah that's pretty much how my kids feel about it when I mention grandchildren too <laughs> you have to laugh anyway I'll have to make peace with it it's never going to happen people but you have to laugh at my dark sense of humour sometimes I ducked out to the supermarket to buy Beauregard some bones and me some bare necessities it hurt to get in the car. It hurt to get out of the car. It hurt in the shop. But I made it home. When was this? 2017, I think I just said. Yes. So I'm not lying when I tell you I have back issues, people. I took some Panadol Osteo, which is useless. You might as well chew mints. <laughs> as my back and my neck are killing me now. I did a lot of work today. I can be satisfied for now. Tomorrow is another day, and tomorrow, and the day after that. And if I never make it, well, I will die a bum too, lol. That's referencing my father. It's not so bad. Some poor schmuck will pick up my ashes, lol. The bow was seriously pissed off when De Mama went out in her cherry metallic car, but when she came home with bones, well, she was quickly forgiven. He is now lying beside me on the couch, resting his jaws and feeling quite happy. Sweet boy. Oh, I miss him. I miss my boy so much. He was like a child. He was just such a delightful personality. I mean, he could be a little shit sometimes, but oh, he was my boy. You'll always be my boy, Beauregard, and Bella Rosa, and all the cats. They'll be girls, my girls and my boys. I'm frantically writing my book, <laughs> or collating my book, like a demon possessed, as I am so grateful and happy 
for the gift of the laptop and I want to get this done before some other horrible, disastrous calamity befalls me, like the last two computers dying on me and not having enough money to replace or fix them. Also, I feel very strongly that it is time I got my book done. Well, it's on vocal media, most of my writings, but I should actually write an actual book, try and actually make some money, but we know how that usually goes. So anyway, Queen of Sabotage here. I'm, it's not always my fault that I'm sabotaged, though, to be fair, people. So that's why I give up so easily. Anyway, it's another thing I'm going to have to push through. Another membrane, another glass ceiling, another intrepid thing I'll have to fight through. Like when I was teaching myself silversmithing in the beginning, and I thought I would never, ever, ever be able to solder. And now I'm getting there. Can't say I'm proficient at it yet, but I'm a lot better than I was in the beginning. Sometimes you just have to be intrepid, people, is what I'm saying. If I was intrepid with my love life, I'd be dangerous. <laughs> you have to laugh. I have suffered horribly for no good reason, and I don't know how long I have left on this planet and I want to leave my legacy behind to show other survivors that they are not alone, that their struggle is real and they are not crazy, that psychopaths and abusers have stolen so much from us, but they can never steal our heart and soul. Never. I, I also am conscious of how my father died, a veritable homeless man in a level one aged care facility, still awaiting a housing commission flat, impoverished and leaving nothing behind but barely enough to cover his own funeral, which I have to say was decent of him. And he was under direct orders from my former lover, back in 2000, David Davidson told me that he'd told my father that he needed two things, a mobile phone and to cover the costs of his own funeral since even back then he knew there was no way I could afford to, to pay for a, a burial or cremation or a funeral for my father, even back then, you know, 20 or 24 years ago now. So that was one one nice thing that Davidson did for me, was lay down the law with my crazy old man to be a bit grounded in reality and to cover those bases. So he did go out and buy himself a cell phone and um, he did pay for his own funeral. That's the only gift he actually left me in his passing. And I am grateful for that because I, I don't know what I would have done. I had no money when he died. Well, I still have no money now. Nothing's changed, but anyway. I worry about how I'm going to afford my own funeral because I don't want my children to be left footing the bill for my funeral either, even though apparently my youngest earns $100,000 a year. But, you know, we haven't spoken in 15 years. There's no way she'd pay for my funeral. She hates my guts anyway. And the eldest... Um, doesn't have much money either. I mean, I think she has, I think she's doing better than me, but I don't think she'd be able to afford to cover the cost of my funeral either. So I'm basically fucked, people. Unless I take a nice quiet swim, swim in some distant bay somewhere like Harold Holt, that might save a lot of problems. Get eaten by sharks or something something cheap and easy it's not just the fish and chips <laughs> on a bare income people oh, no, I shouldn't joke about it I, I, poor Harold Holt that wasn't nice going to sing in that way I shouldn't joke about it 
But anyway, you know what I'm saying, don't you? There's ways around things that don't cost money is what I'm saying. But crikey, it's not totally pleasant outcome either. I don't really want to feed great white sharks. I guess it'll be quick though. It'll be snap, snap, snappy. <laughs> Oh, but, but look, there's so much of me to take them. It'd take them a few hours to chomp away at me. Oh, well. I could always go to um, South America and go swimming in a pool of piranha. It'd be like... Get chewed on from the ankles up. It's a bit like going dancing in the live wire bar. That was like swimming in a pool of fucking piranha. I used to turn to my girlfriend Joe and Sally or whoever was dancing, Gina who was dancing at, at the time, and they'd say, what are you looking at, Tanya? I'd say, oh, it's the first wave. I, I never wear a watch. I haven't worn a watch for 25 years, but I'd say to her, oh, must be the first wave. I said, uh, it must be around uh, about midnight, 12 o'clock now. And they'd look at me and they'd, they'd look at their clock, their watch and go, Yes, you're right, you know, it's 10 to, 10 to midnight. And uh, what do you mean the first wave? I said, oh, it's the grey wolves. The grey wolves come in at at, um, at midnight. Now, who are the grey wolves, Tanya? I said, it's the first wave of predators, the drunk men coming trying to, you know, lure us in for sex. I said, really, Tanya? I went, yeah, look around. They'd look around and be all these grey-headed men all moving in on us and they literally looked like drooling wolves like oh it was it was fucking creepy but it was so creepy that it was funny and they'd look and they'd look back at me and they'd like by joe she's right and I, i'm always right always so uh, we keep dancing as fast as we can another hour would go by and I'd write, I'd say, right, girls, I said, be ready now. And they said, what for, Tanya? I said, it's the second wave now. What's the second wave? I said, the sharkies. <laughs> and I said, they're more drunk now and they're more vicious. And I said, the grey wolves are a bit less, a little bit still larrikin and easy going. I said, but now it'll start getting savage. <laughs> They'd look around and all these men would be moving in on us and they'd be like, <laughs> actually, it's not funny, but if you're a woman out in the dance scene, have a look around. What, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, rock, right? It is like that. <coughs> so all these desperate men moving and they'd be practically drooling. And I'd be, oh, for the love of God, I'd say, incoming. And my friend Karen, who hated all men and everyone equally, except when she was horny, then she loved them all, but that's not my monkey, not my circus. She never did that in my watch. She's very well behaved around me. But anyway, um, she'd scream out, incoming. She'd second me, so I'd be like, incoming. And she'd scream out, incoming. And then all the women and the live bar would all look up and sort of shake themselves off and look around and there'd be always been hordes of them going <laughs> I'd just be standing there on my boots with the Jack Daniels on my head thinking fuck and I'd look up at who whatever band was playing and look up and they'd look at me and nod and I'd be like fuck and Scott I think kind of guessed what I was going on about would look down and go because <laughs> you could see it moving in like this energy of malevolence right <clears throat> it was funny but it kind of wasn't funny at the same time so another hour would go by and because by this time as the hours go by I'd be in my fourth or fifth wind from dancing for three or four hours right because it's a lot on my body that has sleep apnea and asthma and arthritis and all the other fucking things that are wrong with me it's a lot it's a lot of, it's a it's a load on my body. <coughs> so, like, two o'clock would come, and I'd say, I'd turn to the one, my, one of my friends with me, whoever was with me, Jenny or Terry or whoever was dancing with the day, and I'd go, right, now we have the third wave. Here we go. Be ready. 
incoming and karen and i go we go incoming. <laughs> it's almost like a comedy routine it was actually quite hilarious you had to laugh but you had to also be there and so one of them would sidle up to me one of the women they go which wave is it this time tanya i went oh well now we have let me see i said we've had the gray wolves we've had the sharkies i said it must be about between two and three and they checked their watch yes yes it is it's 2 15 i went right on time as expected i said now we have the piranha <laughs> they go what do the piranhas do i said oh they're so drunk and discombobulated and terrified of going home alone without a fuck i said they'll chew you from the feet feet up very very slowly i said but they're the most dangerous of them all i said in fact i think i prefer the gray wolves or the sharkies because at least they're a little bit more honest and they moved in earlier in the evening when they were still relatively sober i said but these motherfuckers that wait to the end of the night so i said oh they're just savage mate i said never go home with anyone you pick up at 3 a.m they're always always almost always a fucking predator and they'd look at me and they went well thanks for telling me that tanya i'll keep that in mind for future reference anyway it was funny but it actually wasn't funny in a way because it was true anyway one night we were dancing and who was it yeah it was joe and some other filipina lady was or Thai lady, little tiny, little petite Thai lady. We were all dancing wildly and joyously because they're with me, they're dancing wildly and joyously, right? Trying to keep up with me because I'm doing my tribal stomping mosh and they're all wiggle, 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 wiggle. We must have looked funny back in the day. It was hilarious. And anyway, we're going off. And this, this guy, this man, just, just starts just in front of us, cross my line of vision, and I'm still going off, and I just turned my head, like my body's facing this way, but my head just went like that way. And Joe comes over to me, she says, which animal, which spirit animal is he? I said, well, on the surface, he looks like he might be a very nice man in real life, but it's 3 a.m., and I've seen the look of desperation in his eyes, she goes, yeah, yeah, so which animal is he? I said, piranha, he would chew you from the feet up. <laughs> and we, we both turned to look at him. He was literally, he didn't know what we were talking about, but he was literally going, probably speeding off his dial, right? <laughs> and Joe took one look and, nudged the other little Thai girl and she looked at me both looked at me we, we all three of us went piranha <laughs> we screamed with laughter we howled with laughter it was hilarious that poor guy but we were right I said we're right trust me we're right but if you want to prove me wrong you know you you're an adult woman and every man woman and child for themselves in the casino who am I to interfere in the course of true love? If you fancy him or anything, don't don't take my judgments on board, you know. Give him a go. <laughs> and I think the little tiger was thinking about it, but she looked at him and she could see him chewing his own face. <laughs> She's like, oh God, Tanya's right. He really is a piranha. He's already started chewing. <laughs> and we just, Screamed and scream with laughter. It was delightful. I must admit, I miss those those nights when, you know, I could have a bit of a, a bit of laugh at the frailties of human sexuality in the first, second, and third wave at the live wire bar. But trust me, that won't just be confined to the live wire bar. It happens in every club and dance space in the in the. Brisbane and no doubt Gold Coast music scene. They really do come in waves. Although it's less obvious at the Brooklyn Standard because it's always busy and it's always packed. So I don't tend to see the, the movement of people 
coming like a wave depositing on a beach all the fucking vermin and then left foundering of all us little fishy little oysters waiting to be picked off, right? It's, it's less um it's less obvious, but yeah, I was I was watching it last night how it the crowd kind of thinned out by about one one thirty, which is good, you know. I, I like it when it gets less busy later in the night because then I get to do my wild mosh and I'm not hemmed in by um drunk people. But yeah, there's not there's not such an obvious onslaught of like literally almost demonic waves moving in of desperate horny men, right? Oh, that's gross. It's so gross. But anyway. <clears throat> now you know why I say I want my true love partner and to be loved and cherished and adored. Oh and have peace for my old age, because that kind of existing out in that scene being, you know, literally bait for predators is not it's not pleasant, people. I mean I've I've managed it for thirteen years, but it, it, it does wear on the nerves occasionally. <clears throat> Even though I can laugh about it at times. Anyway, I continue writing about my father. Because this was still fresh after his death. He left nothing behind to show of his dry wit and incredible talent with storytelling. He was always gonna write his book like his loser daughter and was always gonna succeed one day. All he succeeded at was being a wandering star like a tossed pebble across the water, gathering no moss and being loving and kind to no one, utterly selfish in his quest of existence and leaving no one behind to truly mourn him as the Aaron's women have mourned him enough. And all we can agree on is that he was one unholy cunt of a human being. Meaning myself and my two daughters, that's all we could agree on about my father and their grandfather. That was his legacy he left behind. Awful, isn't it? Bloody awful. His funeral was attended by his lawyer. I had been telephoned by her on Monday morning. What kind of homeless man enlists a lawyer to communicate with his daughter? I mean, indeed. The narcissism is just insanity beyond belief. I've definitely got poop in my hair. It's going together now. Charlie, you're making a mess of the mummy. Why are you sitting in the dark? Are you not feeling well lately? I don't think she's right, you know. A bit worried about her. Oh, little girl. Mummy loves you no matter what. Hmm? Yes. <clears throat> I repeat again, what kind of homeless man enlists a lawyer to communicate with his daughter to manipulate her to take his ashes? By his own admission, he said he didn't care what she did with them because he knew I wouldn't have wanted them back. Trust me on that one. But the lawyer begged me to take them. They belong with his family, she said. You are his family. No, I am not. I am the last of his line. The last of a line of lunatics that caused mayhem and suffering, child sexual abuse, drug addiction, trauma. Did I mention trauma? Another young first cousin I did name it here, but I won't for YouTube. It's it's not necessary. <clears throat> it's a, it's the truth, but why why dig into old wounds now? But anyway, another young first cousin, a female cousin of my Phillips line, died here in Brisbane at the hands of her boyfriend. My uncle flew here from New Zealand for her funeral. 
When I was told she was beaten to death, I was aghast. My father and his brother just shrugged. What could we do? She always had a chip on her shoulder. That's how they spoke about my cousin. It was disgusting. I just looked at them. I thought, you fucking monsters. You're the reason why she died that way, ultimately. Lack of proper parenting and basic genuine care. I was livid beyond belief. <clears throat> All these years I had lived in Brisbane, I had not known my cousin was also living here, struggling with domestic violence and drugs. I could have done something for her, even if only to get her out of that hellhole, perhaps before she was murdered. But I was never told, and my father and uncle never really cared enough. A chip on her shoulder? Who wouldn't with such weak, cowardly, spineless, inadequate men as patriarchs? My uncle was the good one of the family, the respectable one, the righteous one. Is it righteous to shrug off the death of your twin daughter like it was just a sneeze? In the same way, was I cast aside as I was too damaged and too furious and wanted my family of perverts to hold themselves accountable for their neglect and active enablement of Trevor and for their emotional, physical, sexual and financial abuse. No, I was vilified and demonised. I was the truth speaker, the warrior, the fine example of who they could have been if they had at least tried to do the minimum of caretaking for others. I made them feel ashamed and small and weak. Such is life. I rise above them. In my own father's words to me as a young child, Rise and shine. I will never become like them. I was never like them. How it must have rankled to see the Tanya survive after each and every attack on her person. <clears throat> All my life they made me out to be stupid and insane, unworthy and a failure. I tell you what a failure is. It is the cold, blind, unloving inability to step up to the mark to protect your children, to provide them with a safe home and to love them adequately or at least respect them. It is refusing to believe their suffering, their experiences and envying their few successes and gloating and stamping them down in their crises. My parents and half-sister Angela failed me, as did my uncle fail my cousin. They came from their own abusers, as in my grandmother Eva Meyer. They knew better but were suffused with greed for the almighty dollar and building assets, <clears throat> which ultimately were stolen from my mother by con artists anyway. The wheel of fortune keeps turning like a fucking centrifuge in a fairground attraction. Let them fall away like chaff from the wheat, ugly, gloating, greedy golems, all of them. My father's funeral and cremation today. I suppose they will post his ashes up to me next week. Ugh. 
another ordeal for a man who never gave a fuck about me or his granddaughters. I am so sick of psychopaths. And uh, they didn't actually post his ashes up to me until about a week after my birthday in April. So it must have arrived around about the 19th, 20th of April. Can't remember now, but I remember Jared saying, oh, how nice of them to wait till after your birthday and not destroy your birthday for you. I said, it's kind of weird timing, interesting timing. Anyway, he turned up like the proverbial bad penny one last time and I took him and put him in King Island when the low tide came on the, on the Sunday a few days later. <coughs> with Jared. Jared came with me. He was a bit deeply traumatised because I was doing my tribal stomp mosh on the beach, yelling at the spirit of my dead father to never ever come near me again for the rest of eternity and that um, he was disgusting and I hope he was happy being put with my mother in case and Jared actually got a bit traumatised. He thought I was deeply disrespectful, but, you know, unless you walk in my moccasins, he'd never met my father, so he had no idea of what calibre of man he truly was. If he'd met him, he would have completely understood. Um, so <clears throat> I forgave that he didn't understand that I was literally sitting down firm, spiritual boundaries around my own self that is not to be crossed by any of my progenitors um, because I consider them to be that evil. Sitting in the morning sun, having cuddles with my Beauregard, I'm still in a bit of pain in leg and hip from my pinched nerve which is interesting that that all happened at the same time as my dad died. My back went out with sciatica. <laughs> no accidents in the universe, people. I woke up at 4am and was awake for an hour. Got up at 9am. Beautiful day. Hot again, but beautiful. There's a photo of my beautiful boy. <coughs> My Bobo, my Beauregard. Snuggling with the mama. He's safe. He's in Valhalla waiting for me to join him one fine day. One day it will happen at the appointed time ordained by the gods. But I hope they let me have my true loving partnership first for a good, a good long time before I pop my clogs. Because um, I would just like to leave this life knowing that I finally had all the happiness and love that I'd long yearned for. It just seems so unfair and such a tragedy if I should die before I even get to have that dream manifest, you know? And maybe it's ego wanting those things, but maybe it's just my divine right kind of too in a way. So I've wanted it all my life. So um, if nothing else, I'm consistent in what I want for my life. You have to laugh sometimes. 9th of March, 2016. I'm having another nice day. Lynn just visited, so we sat in between rain showers in the garden. What are you doing, Charlie? You're acting very strange. Come and sit with Mama. Come on. You my baby? Can you give me a kissy? <coughs> now I'm back in bed, resting my turbulent chest. I can't remember if I already read that, sorry. Losing it, I'm losing it. I've only had three hours, less than three hours sleep. 
So we're nearly finished. I've just got to move in and out. We'll do a little in and out dance. And then I'll be back in the room, people. 3.11am. I've almost finished shredding the paper stock for making homemade paper. It will... Oh, it has taken me two weeks. I watched Deadly Women about sociopathic female murderers. It was engrossing. It made me think that <clears throat> with my background of abandonment, abuse, trauma, etc., that I am lucky to have not become a serial killer myself. Yet... It seems this was the background of most of these horrific female killers. I can be grateful that although I was almost pushed to the brink of insanity by constant attackers, <clears throat> I have managed to remain a sensible, reasonable sort of person. <clears throat> Even perhaps nice. Shh. Don't tell my enemies. It behooves me well that they perceive me as a homicidal maniac, just in case. Pardon me. But so far, of the 12 people on my hit list, four have died of natural attrition. One completely humiliated herself on national TV, so that was satisfying, even if the evil, psychotic bitch is still alive. And the rest, sigh sighs, the karma train will have left the station. I guess if I'm lucky, God will let me find out how he wreaked justice on my behalf. It's amazing how I have tendency to find out. Even the ghost of that former lover banging on my door early 2016, June 2016, right? That was freaky shit, man. But that's how I found out he died. In the meantime, happiness truly is the best revenge. It took me decades to discover what true happiness even felt like. So I am really quite satisfied. God has let me taste happiness vindication oh, and a measure of peace in my sacred space garden with my animals, true friends and valour. What more could a girl want? Hmm. Keep hearing like the sound of metal grinding. Don't know what my neighbours are up to, but it's starting to get on my nerves, people. It's always something here, always something. 9th of March 2015, 8.30pm. Just woke up, got home at 3.30pm and sonked out cold, or rather hot actually. Boy was I tired. It just hit me like a wall. Feel much better now. I may be getting a Maltese Terrier. Lynn is bringing him over soon. If he doesn't try to kill the cats and the chooks, he will have a new home. I dearly wanted a Pomeranian, but I couldn't afford a puppy. Hopefully this little man will, like all of us, within reason. The cats will have their noses out of joint for a while, but in a short time, the harmony will be restored. Well, that little one didn't pan out, but never mind. I've had a lovely lunch with Crystal. We went to Wool and Gabba to go for a tea reading, but the shop was closed. So we had a lovely lunch instead at Barley and Rye. The food was delicious. Then we had cake and coffee and read each other's cards with the tiny tarot cards I keep in my bag. We looked around the shops too. I have to laugh. Last night 
while dancing at the casino, stalker number two, Antonio, told me if I ate limes and a healthy diet, I would drop 25 kilos. He himself is a short, chubby man. I laughed it off and rubbed his belly and said, You can talk. He has dropped a few kilos though. I told him, Well, I do grow a lime tree, but I don't intend to drop 25 kilos, laughing my ass off. Diet advice from a male suitor was a tad inappropriate. Funny though. The funny thing is, it was the most actual English he has said to me. He usually just gesticulates and I tell him off and tell him to use his words. Ah, speech, so libera liberating. <laughs> the only time he used his words was to insult me for being fat, right? Noise, 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 noise. <sighs> This was the man that used to go insane if I actually, when, it, when I met Opie that time. My God. Just rude when you think about it. Try and control my love life and then tell me that I'm fat. <laughs> oh, well. Anyway, at least I can laugh about it now. He was all right. I mean, like, we danced together a lot over the years. He wasn't bad. But gee, he had some mad ideas. Probably because he was a bit mad, right? Yes, that will be it. <clears throat> Here I posted an article. Your thoughts on their effect on your unborn baby. And I replied, My parents did this to me. Fought constantly during their pregnancy with me. And for the next eight years of my life. Oh, the other day I said in the video they were married for eight years and then I remembered yesterday they were married for 11 because they got married three years before I was born. So they married in 62 and I came along in 65. So yeah, it's funny, I, I keep forgetting things or mixing up things and I like little facts like that. Anyway, I continue on. The bastards made me the emotional squidgy mess I am today. Shmeh. Life goes on. Shmeh means mat, but I added an S-C-H to it to make it sound Jewish, by the way. So yes, I sometimes invent my own words, people. Why not? If it's good enough for William Shakespeare, it's good enough for me, babies. I enjoy my little piece of paradise and my quiet haven from the world. Here I post another article. Indian guru under investigation for persuading 400 men to chop off their testicles. What the fuck? Hmm. Enlightenment or balls? Balls or enlightenment? I can't believe they actually did that to themselves. And ouch. Although pedophiles probably should have been enlisted in that guru's program, I would probably have enjoyed watching Trevor Singh get castrated. Unfortunately, castration does not prevent further child sexual abuse. They just get more vicious. Ninth of March, 2014. Last night was perfect. The vibe was right in the pub, so I was able to relax and be my own unique brand of awesome wildness. I feel so loved and supported by my women friends. By the end of the night, uh, sorry, at the end of the night, my friend Brian was waiting around outside. That's my homeless friend Brian. He shared his pizza with me. <laughs> so sweet. I bought a can of lemonade and shared my lemonade with him. He asked for a photo with me, so I got Creature to take some of us on my iPhone. 
Then I showed him and he was thrilled like a kid. He really did love me, Brian. He was a sweet man. He then asked to look at the photos of us kidding around on the defunct motorcycle. And we laughed and laughed in childlike wonder at our playfulness. Sweet man. He gave me a big hug and I said, Remember, we're just friends. Don't get too carried away. And he nodded happily. When we parted, as it was time to go home to Sarah's, oh, I said her name. Well, you know who Creature is. To its house, he said, I love you. Sweet. So I said, me too, hun. And I did love him. He was a gorgeous, kind soul and a sweet street friend in the night. Other men from the pub looked on in amazement. A crazy homeless man has better skills in how to relate to a woman than they do. I love it. I couldn't help laughing to myself. Certainly put them to shame. Sometimes it was very grounding for me after fending off loutish, inappropriate, feral, lascivious, jumping on my back or trying to rape me, filthy fucking humanoids in the Irish Murphy's pub. And I'd come out to uh, Brian waiting for me with his sweetness. Sometimes that was the most grounding, healing thing just what I'd need after a, a wild night in that pub, dancing to the wild music, of course, which was my sole reason for being there. But it was very grounding having him wait for me sometimes, my beautiful friend Brian. On the way home, Creature and I stopped in the drive through of McDonald's and the young man serving on the intercom completely made our night by openly declaring that he doesn't eat their shit, but the, bur the burger I ordered was the best of the bad food there. We howled with laughter. I said, darling, I hope your superiors are not recording this convo or you will be out of a job. He cried, I don't care. This is my very last shift. <laughs> when we got to the window, I congratulated him on his celebration of honesty, a term first used by my friend Jared when he liberated himself from the hell of working for my ex-husband in our business and the boss that came after that and yet another when he was practically indentured and sold with the business each time actually illegal by the way he was sold like part of the business uh, chattels it was unbelievable this young man was good looking intelligent and an anarchist i was rather perturbed to learn he was leaving maccas for a career in the army i said please reconsider i don't want you to get shot to which he replied, my mother said the very same thing as both my father and grandfather were shot while serving. Then he laughed nervously. I gave him a steely glare, but alas, family histories or curses are destined to repeat in each generation until finally, by the grace of God, someone breaks the pattern. <laughs> I shall pray for his safety. Such promise, such wit, such ebullient youth deserves to make old bones and a mark on the world. When we got to Creatures, we ate and I slept next to her as we were utterly content and exhausted from our big 
nights out. She made me pancakes for breakfast, yum, and together we watched Hauntings Australia on Fox Tower. Then I finally dragged myself away as I needed to feed the hens and goldfish and Miss Penny, who was relieved and happy to have the mama home. Last night, Zeus and Hercules, creatures to Bichon freeze, freezes, slept on the bed, and Zeus, who was older and rather fond of me, slept in my arms all night, and if I moved, he snuggled closer with his back touching me, just like my Bella used to do. It was just so lovely and comforting. In the morning, rather Arvo, I told Creature how I think we need men who love us as much as our pets do, with complete loyalty, faithfulness, devotion, strength of character, protection and great affection. We both laughed a tad with bitterness, but I said, it could happen. Anything is possible. It only takes meeting the one. So my gorgeous, beautiful, young creature is going out again. I am so proud of her. I pray she finds the right man for her soon, a man who will love her completely as she deserves, and may she be blessed with a wonderful, happy life. Amen. Update, 9th of March, 2021. Well, that friendship turned into an evil cesspool, complete with her stench. Another narcopath, but I have done well in not inviting any more narcissists into my life in recent years. I have finally grown into my own being enough to protect my heart and mind from those kinds of vicious, capricious, low-level psychic vampires. Thank the gods for that. Here I post an article. You wouldn't even notice this walking by, but take a closer look and woa seriously. And I replied, I don't even know what that's referencing now, but here's my comment. I would have a complete mental breakdown in a space like that. My cottage with three bedrooms sometimes stifles me which is why I am out roaming so much. So if I got put anywhere smaller, I would really not cope well at all. As for helping writers focus, what the fuck? I would hate to be in a tiny space. Try, oh, I must have been something about the tiny home movement. I would hate to be in a tiny space trying to illuminate my thoughts on profound subjects. I'm expansive. I need height, width and depth to feel alive, never mind to create. Fortunately, not everyone is like me and perhaps some writers or creatives thrive under those conditions. Best of luck to them. Which is why I'm kind of looking forward to the cooler weather, you know, as we get further into autumn, you know, by April it cools down enough. I'm looking forward to making these video logs outside in my garden um, or writing when I'm outside in my garden in the cooler weather. I think more clearly and I'm more productive when I'm outside and surrounded by plenty of space and nature and I'm not one to be kept in a confined little fucking gilded cage. Not this little black duck. So uh, anyway, 9th of March 2013. 
I had a very mixed mood today. Broke, so I stayed home tonight. Thank you, Sylvia, for the inspiration. I will go out Saturday night by hook or by crook. I had a couple of energy shifts, one at 6ish p.m. and another at 1 a.m. Powerful love feelings. Maybe someone was thinking of me, or maybe I will meet someone nice soon. It was an odd feeling. Well, I am off to bed as it's 3.30 a.m. It will be nice to see what later today brings my way. Good times, I hope, smiley face. And yes, it was a bit odd yesterday. I was intuiting someone's thoughts or love, loving feelings towards me. I was picking up on that. I ran about 7 p.m. last night. So I kind of did a little pause because I was actually painting my um, my amulet that my friend John Bradley made for me. And um, and I thought, oh, who's this? Who's sending me this? Because I don't always know who it is. Um, some of my, you know, like that former lover I'm that stalks me at um, red lights and crossroads, he has a distinctive soul signature that... As soon as I sense it, I know I know it's him. It's so fucking intense and sticky and cloying, and I know it's him. But this one is lighter, um, almost playful. It's masculine, but it's almost um, boyish and playful. And I I'm th I think I know who it might be. But I'm not 100% certain if it's the person I think it is. So it's it started to happen fairly regularly in recent weeks that I'd get the sudden influx of real love energy. Um, I also can be quite attuned after 13 years of therapy to my psychiatrist, but I don't think that was him last night. It was, um, yeah, more of a, I had a more of a, um, someone thinking romantic thoughts about me but had more of that kind of intimate love energy rather than the um, the soul signature of my psych psychiatrist when I sense him it's more um, like a big brother or father figure being protective and you know often I would, when I sense it I would come into therapy and, uh, or I sometimes would make contact and say is everything okay? I, I can actually sense your energy. And he'd be actually quite astonished because I'd be very often accurate. Um, but that's how you know when you have a, a soul connection with, with someone that you know you can trust or you, you've built up a an attunement over time, you know. I'm not sure why I still have that soul signature with um, with Dave because he certainly wasn't trustworthy or honouring, or respectful, or even fucking kind. So it's weird, but at least, at least I know by the nature of feeling sticky and cloying and like like th like thick, heavy tre treacle. I know it's a. That's how my spirit identifies that malevolence, that that sort of um, controlling, possessive fucking evil it's thick and kind of unpleasant you know like being bathed in slime so now I've worked that out and I know who that is um, I'm more able to discern the lighter the lighter sensations are more loving and positive and um, heartfelt are light and happy and sometimes a little bit tingly and it's sweet it's sweet I don't know who it was yesterday but I felt I felt them twice yesterday I felt them in the morning as well about eight o'clock ish I thought that's interesting it's early early in the morning for me to be picking up on those kind of energies but yeah I felt them at eight o'clock in the morning and I felt them again at um, around about seven ish last night so it'll be interesting if I can figure out who it is 
if they can later on validate and say, oh, yeah, I was thinking about you or whatever, you know, just, just so I can have validation that I am indeed picking up on um, people's energies or intentions towards me. Because uh, I'm trying to hone it. I'm trying to hone it as a, um, a gift of discernment, people. It could come in quite handy later on in life when uh, I don't even need to communicate and I have that level of telepathy, right? Uh, I have that level of telepathy with my friend Jared and with Lynn and also with Lynn in New Zealand, um, which can be quite intense at times. I know when I had a massive emotional mental breakdown in 1996, I was uh, actually had a full breakdown. I was taken against my will to the PA hospital and they were thinking about admitting me to the hospital, which was just fucking rude given I had every right to be in the state I was in given what had just been what I'd just been put through, which they concurred and they did send me home. But my um my friend Lynn Robertson in New Zealand rang me up a few days later and she said, um, Are you okay? And I said, actually no, I'm not okay and I said, I've just gone through a, a horrendous breakdown. And she said, oh, that's really interesting. And I said, oh, why, Lynn? And she said, I just had these really intense feelings that something was wrong with you. And then I was having these really bad dreams. And she said, so I've been freaking out. And I thought I'd ring and check on you. And I said, well, I'm glad you did because your, your intuition and your telepathy is right on point. I've just gone to hell and back in the last few days and I'm still recalibrating from it and it's going to take me some time to to process. And I said, but thanks for checking on me. It shows that, you know, our, our, um, our connection, our, uh, you know, childhood friendship was still very, very much, yeah, attuned and connected and... Um, What's the word? Beautiful and almost holy, you know. These are uh, these connections. Yeah, I might you might not see people for decades, but the um, the energetic connection remains just as pure and just as powerful as the first day you met, kind of thing. That's what I'm trying to explain. Here we go. Charlie's going walk about down my sleeve. Where are you going, Charlie? Um, 9th of March 2011, show us your long New Zealand, which was about, um, you know, the old style toilets where you just had this long drop, literally a long drop dug into the ground, stink, you still have them in camping grass sometimes. So I commented... I have horrid memories of the outdoor loo in country Victoria, the Grampians to be exact. I was a little kid and peed myself on the way to the outhouse in the freezing cold and felt most embarrassed and traumatised by the experience. I swore never ever to have to endure an outdoor loo ever again. But after the Christchurch earthquake, my fellow countrymen and women are forced by the situation to create the outdoor loo again. So creative and so good for composting, it almost makes the act of toileting outside bearable. Don't forget the beautiful plants you'll have growing in that stuff in a year's time. Nothing shitty. <laughs> And uh, my friend Michelle wrote, my former friend Michelle wrote, what an impressive sight. My Yank engineer husband who works in wastewater management really enjoyed seeing this. And I replied, I'm glad he enjoyed it, lol. Kiwis are really a most impressively creative lot. We were the first to split the atom via Dr. Rutherford, although I'm not sure that is something we should brag about. We won the Indian race 
um, in Atlanta, Georgia, the world's fastest Indian, a great movie and a bike ridden by a middle-aged eccentric South Islander from New Zealand. Also, we tend to be very inventive as back in the older days. We were so far away from the rest of the world, it took months, if not years, to catch up with Mother England or Europe. So basically, we had to design and manufacture our own stuff. Have a look at the Clever Bastards website too. It's amazing what creative and clever people are making in art and design over there. Almost makes me want to go home. But then I remember that I can't stand the cold. And then my friend Tania, who we both delivered our children on the same day, back in 1985, wrote, However, there would be a downside to this. Don't invite me over for a hungy. <laughs> she was Māori. And I replied, Ah, uh, well, she is Māori. Um, yeah, we wouldn't want a hungy made out of this stuff unless it biodegraded for about 10 years, lol. I miss hungies. Then I also wrote on that day in 2011, a low mood blah day. I slept most of the day after the callous attitude of my GP yesterday. Jeez, I shouldn't let assholes get me down. I should be over it but it's just one attack after another. So I went out and bought some odds and ends so I can do more home maintenance. This time I'm remaking magnets for my fridge from some old cards I had kept in my card collection. Also going to put up cool cards in my bedroom. Tomorrow I'm going to get my hair retouched. It's due again on the 19th. Oh, dear goddess. I hate that part where you look awful the last few weeks. Never mind. So that should be nice. I hope I feel a bit brighter tomorrow. It will take me some time to regroup from the crap of losing Jared's hmm, friendship. That was one of the times when we weren't talking, 2011. And now my male doctor insulting me. On the upside, I got a few ripe raspberries off my vines today. That was worth getting up for. I checked on my earthworms in the worm farm and they still had plenty of food and seemed to be happily doing their composting wormy thing. All good. So thus concludes today's readings of Even Date and um, I hope you enjoyed seeing Island Bay and hearing me regale stories from the live wide bar at the casino and telling you about my wonderful night last night and all the other weird and quirky things that have happened on the 9th of March. And um, on that note, I'm going to finish now. It's a beautiful day outside, it's still very windy though, and uh, I might go do some more painting on that amulet, or I might just bloody well go and try and have a little sleep and a lie down. It's now 2.54pm, almost 3pm, and I'm actually quite tired. I guess if I push myself for a few more hours I could just eat dinner and go to bed early and crash and burn, right? So I'm not sure whether I'll carry on painting or whether I'll just crash and burn now and get up later in the evening. Can't decide. It'll happen, whatever happens, when it happens, when it ever happens, like my true love partnerships. <laughs> You can't hurry, love, but you just have to wait because love don't come easy, but it's a game of give and take. 
And um, on that crazy night, Mama T, trying to break ancient curses and patterns here, sends you love, joy, shalom, blessings of better health and prosperity, and comfort and ease, and joy in your lives, surrounded by people who truly, deeply love, value, cherish, and honour you. Because that's what I want for myself, and I'm not selfish. I think everyone on planet Earth should have their own true loves and their own measure of happiness and success. So, bye for now, my darlings. Blessed be from sacred space at Titania's realm. Love is the law.